you know what I've seen Terry Nelson. <laughs> Since I was given permission to leave Halifax, and it was legal for me to do so, and I was given permission by the Coast Guard, 
started a custom then, and if it was legal then, it had to be legal three days later. But, as the uh, field court judge put it, he said, I presume that Captain Watson takes a great deal of pleasure out of interfering with overfishing activities. And the, the sound is just so bad here that I'm <laughs> going to uh, <laughs> cut this tape off here. That was completely overturned. But Paul Watson is an incredible speaker. <laughs> and a very good presence. You see why he is employed as a lecturer.
Canucks are going to take it. You know? So we're going to take everything we can. And Canada's attitude is the exact same thing. We've seen it on this coast in our competition with the United States. It wasn't for the actions of the United States uh, last year. The salmon would be uh, in much, much more trouble than they are in right now. They voluntarily did not take fish that we were taking from them. So we're pretty good as a government at pointing our fingers at other countries. But uh, Canada has not been a very, set a very good example of fish conservation. I debated Mr. Tobin in April on CTV. I said, Mr. Tobin, there's one pirate to another. What's the difference <laughs> between what you did and what I did? And he said, well, the difference is, is that I had the authority of Parliament behind me, and you did not. He said, well, how did Parliament give you authority outside of Canada? And he said, the difference was is that to change, to make change, and we're talking conservation here, Paul. To make change, you have to be ahead of the law. You have to set a precedent. I said, yes, I was two years ahead of you being ahead of the law. <laughs> this is not the same thing. And he says, I can't comment any further. That's a matter of course. <laughs> so anyway, the whole charade continues to go on. Mr. Tobin <coughs> wants to give the illusion of protecting fish without actually protecting any fish at all. We want to, in this province, give the illusion of protecting the forests when, in fact, the name of the game is problem. I know that a lot of people don't uh, support our approach. I don't really care. That's not what, one of my major concerns in life. I had a few years ago, I always sank uh, these vessels in, uh, in Norway, in Iceland. I had an individual support me, and he said, uh, now I just want to let you know that what you people did in Iceland was despicable, criminal, unforgivable. I said, so, who are you? I said, what's your name? He said, John. I said, John, if we should have called you up and asked you what your opinion was before we did it, because, John, we didn't do it for you. We did it for the whales. And we did it for all of those people who are going to be on this planet a thousand years from now. But quite frankly, they're going to look back and say, thank God somebody did something. You know, history has a way of where today's fanatics are often tomorrow's angels, and where a guy might be hungry for treason, like the movie reality appears on a postage stamp 100 years later as a hero. So you really can't let your actions be dictated by the uh, prejudices of your own peers within your own presence. And so we operate for the future because we're much more concerned about being good ancestors to our great great grandchildren than we are to you know whether people support what we do or don't support what we do. And we and to do that, I think that the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society feel, fulfills a valuable niche within the uh, diversity of the environmental movement. We're the rabble rousers, the shit disturb disturbers, and the, you know, the people that you can all hate and dislike and uh, you know, criticize and whatever. But we expand the envelope. Because after people of the opposition, that is, is through dealing with us, they're much more willing to talk to more mainstream groups. <laughs> we don't talk to them. We go in and kick them in the teeth and then other people can come in and talk to them. It's the way we go about doing things. And at the same time, we have to operate within the context of the rules of the meeting. And although my ships don't carry weapons, we do have sort of weapons. For instance, uh, when we were attacking the Faroe Islands, we defended ourselves from the Faroese police with our pie guns. So you load uh, Boston. We, what we had was barrels of pie guns that we got from the uh, Department of Agriculture in the United States. You wouldn't want any stuff. It sits on our deck for two, two years. It doesn't decay. Uh, when you're trying to board the vessel and you get a 45 gallon shot of chocolate pie in the face, so it's a good deterrent. It stops you from coming in. And you know, we spin bombs, of course, and uh, butyric acid, but we're now coming up for, uh, we've got a new thing called pseudocorpses, this is what you train police dogs to find dead bodies with, and that can be very convincing when you toss that out of the deck of a vessel. And uh, we, now have, uh, we now have a submarine, which we painted yellow, so we brought into reality the yellow submarine. It's called the Mirage. And it's interesting, when I got the submarine, I was criticized by a representative of the Canadian Navy who said, what, and it was quoted in the Vancouver sign, what kind of Monty Python circus is this anyway? He said, well, the Sea Shepherd doesn't know anything about submarines. You know, they're totally irresponsible having them have a submarine. And I said, well, wait a minute. Since World War II, we have ran more ships, boarded more ships, sunk more ships than the Canadian Navy. You don't have the experience or the expertise. <laughs>
Faroese can complain all they want about how aggressive and violent they were, but as a dripping with chocolate pie, it just really is like invincible <laughs> to the uh, to the uh, to the island and, and complain that they're violent. So I uh, thank you for uh, having me here, and uh, I'm very appreciative to be here, and uh, I'd be very pleased to answer your questions. I'm taking uh, what you said about doing what you do best and uh, seeing as we're mostly lawyers in this case. Uh, I was wondering who represents you and how you get involved on that level to work with an organization like Sea Shepherds to, to who represents you legally? Yeah. Well, we have a, quite a small army of lawyers. <laughs> Happily uh, to say uh, most of them are volunteers, otherwise it wouldn't be possible. Uh, in the United States, we have the advantage, of course, is that lawyers have to devote so much time to nonprofits, so we take advantage of that. So uh, that helps a lot. We have lawyers in Iceland, lawyers in Norway, and uh, in Canada. The, uh, in fact, this last case it was uh, Mr. Brian Casey, who is our lawyer in Newfoundland. He was originally from Victoria, but has been now living in Newfoundland for some time. It's, uh, within this movement, and uh, you just can't go into this uh, half-hearted. If you've made the decision where you're going to put yourself in court then you have to have the, the best defense possible. And for that, for that reason, there's uh, certainly, I don't think, any going to be any lack of uh, need for good lawyers uh, within the environmental movement, especially uh, as things deteriorate into the future. I think we realize that 100 million buffalo were removed from our plains within, within 80 years. 75 years of careless logging has left us with only a few trees standing. If you were given the legislative powers, what would you do to first steps to fix up our salmon industry here on the coast of British Columbia? I think the answer to that is very simple, both for the logging industry and the fishing industry. You can solve both of those, uh, the, the problems there both very easily by simply restoring traditional fisheries and traditional uh, forestry. That is, get rid of McMillan Blowdown, get rid of every major corporation that, that, that out there raping the forests and the oceans, get rid of BC Packers and uh, Jimmy Patterson's fishing company. They're, they're, these are maximum profits to the minimum amount of people with the fewest number of people employed in the industry. What, what is one of those trees worth? Do you have any idea what a, an average Douglas fir is worth? All around maybe 15,000, a big one. So there you go, you have what, two, three, four trees, and that certainly is going to support, support a family quite easily. And there's enough trees in here to support uh, everybody, and in fact, create probably another 20, 30,000 jobs in the uh, environment, within the logging industry, if it was brought back to more traditional values. And uh, that's what we have to do. And I know it's a, a, a radical solution, but it's the only thing that's going to work because you cannot have this maximum exploitation for maximum profit in the shortest period of time, employing the least number of people. It has to be the employment of the most number of people for the uh, for the the profit as is needed to support that community. And that's the only way it's going to uh, survive. In Newfoundland, for 15 years, the traditional inshore fishermen warned the government of Canada that the cod fishery was going to collapse. Nobody listened to them. Those big draggers went out and they took everything they possibly could. And that is what, is what, what has destroyed the cod fishery. Of course, if you ask the Department of Fisheries, well, the seals ate them all. <laughs> well, there was once 30 million harp seals and certainly no shortage of codfish, so I don't really understand the logic behind that. But, you know, human beings have this incredible capacity to rationalize and justify everything they do and blame it on somebody or something else. And the fact is, is that there will be no future in this province, uh, just as there is no future in Newfoundland, if we continue to abide by the policies of the Department of Fisheries and Ocean and by forestry policies that are here. And the solutions are very plain for everybody to see. We just have to uh, take the lessons of Mr. Schumacher and uh, understand that small is beautiful and uh, simplify, 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 and get down to the basics. This question, next question, are we right? Yeah, I, I kind of find it interesting that um, in this conference, there's a lot more opportunity and time to question Mr. Paul Watson than um, 
than uh, CEOs of major corporations. Not quite sure why that is, but I have a question anyway. Um, um, so I want to ask what your feelings about um, Greenpeace are at this point in time, about what they're doing, and uh, how that goes along with what you were saying about throw a pen within the environmental movement. Because I've, I don't know, I've, I've read and heard quotes from yourself about Greenpeace that kind of contradict what you're saying about that. But um, I guess yeah, kind of interesting. So. Greenpeace is part of the diversity of the environmental movement. I've got no problems with Greenpeace as long as Greenpeace leaves me alone. But when I'm attacked, I attack back. And uh, back in 1986, after uh, I appeared on the Dave Barrett show, and somebody flew in a bomb threat to protest my violence. And they had to evacuate the building. And while I was up there, a reporter put a microphone on me and says, what's your reaction? Greenpeace just condemned what you did in, uh, in Iceland as an act of terrorism. And I said, well, you know, I didn't want to really get into a pissing match with Greenpeace, so I said, I don't know what do you expect from the Avon ladies, the environmental movement anyway. Well, they never forgiven me for that. I, you know, I can be called a terrorist, but, you know, I, maybe I get too close to the truth on that one. I've been quite willing to work with Greenpeace uh, over the years, and I've always found it very strange, as one of the original people in Greenpeace, that Greenpeace promotes harmony uh, throughout the world between nations and uh, peace within the environment, but it can never seem to make peace within its own family. And uh, until that happens, then there's going to be that animosity. As you're well aware, the most vicious feuds are family feuds. And uh, the uh, people who uh, first began with Greenpeace and people who are with Greenpeace now and everything, it's all one family. I mean, I'm still Greenpeace. I'm a lifetime member. My number is 007, which means I'm the eighth member because Bob Huntress was 000. <laughs> but, uh, so I am a lifetime member of Greenpeace. I'm quite we're willing to work with Greenpeace, but I will, when I am attacked as, uh, for my approach, then I'm going to defend that approach. Like, for instance, uh, on Wednesday night, I was presented with the, uh, United Nations Association of Canada Award, uh, the Eugene Rogers Award. They called me up and said, we've selected you to receive this award. I said, oh, thanks, you know, it's going to be very helpful because I'm using the World Charter for Nature as, uh, as my defense, and this is a UN award. Well, the next day they called me up and said, well, we can't give you the award. And I said, well, why not? And they said, because Paul George of Western Canada Wilderness Society said you don't deserve it, and they do it. And I said, oh, well, you know, it's a little embarrassing since I've just put out a press release saying that I just got an award. <laughs> so what's, what that means is the UN has told me that they can't give the award to anybody this year because it wouldn't be ethical for them to give it to somebody else having already selected me to be the person to get it. But see, this just shows you the kind of uh, intolerance that you have within the movement. Frankly, I couldn't give a damn if I got the award. I was nominated for the BC Environment Minister's Award here uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I said, I had to denounce it before I received it because I said, you know, I can't take an award from the Nature Destruction Party and I will not. And of course, Mr. Kishore said, well, we wouldn't give it to you then. <laughs> I said, well, why did you send me the nomination? Well, we, he said, you can't expect me to read every letter that comes in front of me that I sign. <laughs> so, but I can proudly say that I have never won an award. And uh, the day I start getting awards from corporations and governments is the day that I retire from the environmental movement because I will not be fulfilling my niche within this movement. Do you have a question right here? Yes, Paul. Um, several years, about 1990, 1989, 1990, we started building trails in the Malton Valley around the Parmata there. In 91, the government's changed and it's made your war about road building. And we got the corporations to slap injunctions on us, like, which I'm sure you're familiar with, most people aren't. For a civil lawsuit. Now, four years after, we, we, we still haven't gone to court, but we still have this harassment case on our hands. And uh, to build up an organization grassroots wise, again, when, when you, those pressures are going on, we've got this government that's got a better media machine than ever has been assembled, probably in North America before working against the environment, against nature. I guess I got a question to throw at you, and that's how are we going to get these lawyers, and how are we going to get this? coming forth again, uh, how do we get lawyers on board? How do we get the sexy, scandalous, wild sort of image <laughs> coming forth so we can sort of catch people on the way, so to speak? You know, well, I wouldn't advocate the use of violence, but you can certainly utilize the illusion of violence. But uh, how do you get lawyers? Well, you ask people and uh, you make your presence known to the legal community. There's a lot of people 
people in the legal profession who are certainly willing to, uh, to, to donate their time and their experience and their, and their skills. At the same time, you're going to have to be expected to pay some lawyers too because they have to make a living also. And uh, there's, you know, the one thing that the environmental movement, the conservation movement, even the animal rights movement talk about, you know, is that they never have any money. Bullshit, they got a lot of money. And uh, they raise a lot of money. And they can afford to, need to, use, to use lawyers when they need if there's a need for lawyers. And uh, it has to be understood within the conservation movement that lawyers are a tool just as much as I use a ship as a tool. Or uh, anybody uses a, you know, a whatever tactics, education as a tool. It is a tool and it has to be used. I think that the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund is certainly uh, is an example of uh, just how uh, successful that approach is. And here you've got an organization really that supports that approach uh, almost exclusively. Uh, you're, you're unfortunately in a civil suit, which we which, well, which just becomes, and rather than the $35,000 suit, it becomes a half million dollar suit to the $400,000 in the way of security and, you know, building machines up and so on. Uh, I guess the whole thing is just the frustration of working against these powers, which, which, which I think, maybe it's just to tell everybody that's what's going on for us. Maybe that's it. Maybe it is a matter of getting people to come on board and go seek out lawyers, do that. But when you get something like a three-month trial from the court, that's enough to, to take any lawyer that's worth, it's going to knock any lawyer out of schedule who wants to do this good thing. Maybe put 10,000 worth of energy up. But when you come to that type of half million dollar sort of legal fee, you've got to have all of them on your side. Well, then you can recruit Hollywood. I mean, they're, they're always that's my question. They're always doing that. But I suggest you, if you're going to get involved, involved in that kind of action where the civil suits are going to be laid against you, then I would recommend that you become a stone. You just don't own anything. And uh, let them sue you for anything they want. You don't got the money, you don't have to pay it. Okay, we'll go to the next question then over here. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm one of these terrible human beings, right? That apparently doesn't have any sense. I made up a 17 trillion microorganisms. I'm part of the biosphere. Right? Now the thing is, we, what is all the ripping and tearing of the material world, right? Feeding one another to loan sharks and dragging one another before the legal authorities are doing about it. You know, the thing is, every country, what it's about, a flag of convenience for bloody law so you can do what the other country won't let you do. Is there a question? Canada, Canada is a a flag of convenience. We have a tuna fleet because we didn't sign the international tuna agreement. So we have a question for Mr. Well, all the thing is, we need some answers and solutions. Never mind. We heard his. We heard how great he is. No, he has some sense. I'm not taking fault with anything that's right. Anything anybody does is right. But the thing is, he's talking about divine rule. And the big family squad. Okay, I think we're going to move on to the next question. There's some of the Everybody in the planet is related to me, including your enemies. Right? Now, what is the family squad all about? Okay, the next question, please. You're not a scientist. Everybody should, should know about the environment or not. I mean, I've been wasting my time. I've got to go on the next question. Thank you. Well, the um, all the time to get you back on track. I your thoughts, Mr. Wilson. Um, it's just as people as well. Totally opposed to it. Uh, the Maka want to take whales. Traditionally, they never took any uh, any gray whales. They took humpback whales. The, endangered, the gray whale is just a year off the endangered species list. It's now running a gauntlet from uh, whaling by the you know, sort of whispering to each other, not really reaching anybody at all. Maybe <coughs> see anything wrong. For instance, I'm criticized a lot for, you know, how come you have a, a diesel burning uh, ship and not a sailing boat, which is more environmentally sound? You know, well, I can't catch a whaling boat with a sailing vessel. You know, I have to make that compromise. I have to use a ship that's going to be effective for me. Otherwise, I'll be just sitting around chasing boats and never get anywhere. And, you know, I might have a good time getting something, but I'm not going to really accomplish anything. And so you have to, I uh, think, use uh, those tactics uh, and uh, the tools that are provided by the dominant culture that we live in. We live in a media culture. And uh, in fact, we live in such a media culture that reality is now confused with, uh, with fantasy. I mean, I, I hear people talking about, uh, uh, well, in fact, I think it was illustrated by that, uh, uh, it was a commercial for one of the 
networks in the States where the guys were talking about the guy needed a lawyer. And he says, well, uh, I know uh, I know the perfect lawyer for it, Matt <laughs> And see, people believe that these people are real. And then they begin to, you know, so fantasy and reality become so uh, confused that I don't see it any other way around, but you, but operating within the context of that of that culture. I guess my question is, you have a vision for the future, and I mean, I, I presume that you wouldn't like to see that the way it is forever. If you're looking at thousands of generations down the line, or do you always see? Well, I hope you will evolve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see that now. What you're saying is, this is the action that you see is most efficient or effective for whatever. Yes, I know. Uh, like for some people for the ethical treatment of animals, which is an animal rights organization, which is trying to promote an ethic that they very passionately believe in. They are using, for instance, they have models who are posing uh, nude on billboards and uh, in New York and places, and then the thing is, I'd rather go nude than wear fur. Well, it's a way of, these models have offered their skills, their abilities, their talent to getting that message out. And in the best way they could possibly do so. Now, people would criticize them for doing this. You know, and uh, uh, Claudia Shipper takes her clothes off, which she's not really exposing. Well, I guess she is. But anyway, the thing is that uh, when she does this, people criticize her for exploiting that. But at the same time, that's her business. She gets exploited all the time. But now she's being exploited in a way that she's getting something that she believes across to the public. And, uh, you know, you can debate back and forth on the morality of that and everything, but. The long and the short of it is she is being effective. Okay. Or, or she could be effective any other way uh, within the context of what she does. We have time for one more question. Right. Uh, you seem to take great pleasure in hurling Boston cream pies at the closing. And you also take great pleasure in hurling the proverbial pie at the legal system of the Canadian government and having them incur three or four million dollars in expenses. Oh, why did the cause do that? I was wondering if you could uh, comment on what initi initi initiatives you've taken in the spirit of cooperation as opposed to the city. Well, you're right. I do take a great deal of pleasure in throwing pie at police officers, but I really can't take responsibility for the government spending the money. I can mean, they do that on their own. No, I'm not responsible for their, uh, for their waste. But as for what kind of initiatives, I mean, we approach this in many different ways uh, to try and find solutions. Uh, for instance, uh, in Scotland, when uh, they were killing seals there, what we did was we had a lot of dramatic confrontations. But what we were able to do, because of those dramatic confrontations, is raise the funds to purchase the island where they were killing the seals on. And so we were able to, you know, to make that seal sanctuary by by doing that. Uh, for instance, recently we put up a reward uh, in Yellowstone National Park for the uh, apprehension of the person who killed the gray wolf a few months ago. He was in fact just found guilty yesterday. So we work within the context, you know, we work with different uh, regulatory bodies, like for instance, uh, National Parks uh, in the United States, uh, in that respect. And uh, one of the, probably the most positive solutions that we've come up with in the last two years is we found an alternative to the Canadian seal hunt, uh, which is a non-lethal, cruelty-free alternative. I found a couple of years ago, while I was on the ice, that baby car seals lose their, their hair. And, uh, that would be freely brushed away. In fact, you could actually pluck it out and you get 60 grams per seal of heart seal hair. Now, these hairs are very uh, hollow and uh, retain heat inside of them and therefore are ideal insulating fibers, better than eider down. We've now contacted a company in Germany, Kirchhoff uh, Bedwerenfabrik, or Kirchhoff Bedding Company, that has developed a bulking process to use these hairs and we will be able to then uh, you make bed comforters and sleeping bags out of harp seal hair, molded harp seal hair, taken from the seals after they've been weaned. And this will create a high-end product which we predicted will sell or determined will sell in Europe for about $1,200 per bed comforter. And so there you have a product that can be obtained from a few seals which is, can sell for a lot more money than what they've traditionally been doing because all they have right now for a market for seals is their penises for the Taiwanese Voodoo uh, Medicine Market. But, uh, so these are the kind of solutions that we are finding. We also came up with a, a solution to stop dragging off the grand banks of uh, Newfoundland. We suggested this to the Canadian government. Of course, the Canadian government isn't going to implement it because they see in the future can, uh, fleets of Canadian draggers back out there after the cod recovers miraculously. But uh, the simple way to stop draggers is to go out there and sink every derelict dragger you've got, every ship you've got onto the grand banks. Nobody's going to be 
dragging the bottoms with all those wrecks there. And at the same time, you're going to provide a very valuable habitat for fish recovery within those wrecks. So it's a, it's a positive solution. <laughs> you know, so we do come up, we do try to come up with positive solutions to these problems. And that, I think, is one of the most important aspects of what we do. But of course, it doesn't get the same kind of, uh, the same kind of public attention because it doesn't have those elements which I mentioned earlier. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just ask questions there, and I'd like to ask everyone once again to uh, join me in thanking Mr. Watson for participating in this show. And I'd like to invite everyone now to join us in the lounge where we'll be holding a reception in the chart. Sides. Companies here 
here and people can secure some company practices, departments represent, departments are represented, and the environment of the so it's in the spirit of the controversy that surrounds the law. The conference has been going on for several years. Uh, it's growing in uh, popularity every year. And I think one of the reasons is because, because of the wide range of speakers and issues. Is it is there really an address to so body here in the and the conference like this goes over I, I, I think Victoria is a very, very good place to have to hold this in addition to the Did you, did, 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 did you kind of grasp the universities of the environment? So our faculty is very Very, very few people, and that would be, you know, that, that was, you know, that's your point. Yeah. You know, well, they, you know, just the fact that, you know, they, they, much less people than there is an ability. It is the most significant yeah. problem on the planet right yeah. now, is, is, is human population. Okay, great, thank you. So, oh, yeah, yeah, talk. Yeah. so the media is after you now. They're going to trap you for tomorrow. You got to say something really damaging now. You know, you got a, quite a reputation to uphold. Keith Wells, <coughs> that's me. Might if we get a quick comment? Sure. Great. Well, that's bullshit media. No, no, you're going to use them to your advantage. We know that. <laughs> oh yeah, but we're watching Channel Six here, like like Check Six. We know these guys. Uh, we see them, they, they use any kind of sleaze bag tricks they can to get their message out. Yeah.
Right. Well, there's a lot that has to be uh, developed within, the, uh, within international law, especially in areas beyond national jurisdictions. And there's a hesitancy to do that because of this thing which is called the tragedy of the commons. That is that it's all out there to be exploited and everybody is trying to get, for instance, some of the last fish. And uh, so the only reason when you start to look at implementation of conservation law is when those fish start disappearing, as we're seeing with Canada now, trying to uh, extend international law outside the 200-mile limit, but not really doing a very effective job at it. But uh, I remember back in the mid-70s when there was only a three-mile limit or 12-mile limit, and that was extended to 200 miles. And the, re and the reason that happened was because of activism, because of, uh, and also because of the depletion of fish populations at that time. Now we've reached the point where they've depleted it even further, and there's now that need. Unfortunately, the need to extend jurisdiction is being dictated by scarcity instead of by foresight. How about uh, talking about your situation right now, uh, you know, the recent thing in Newfoundland, uh, uh, that continues itself. Yeah, the government is very stubborn. And, uh, you know, I always find that when you're in a legal battle, and it lasts for at least 10 years. The last time it lasted 10 years, and we ultimately won. And this will probably last the same amount of time, but I'm very confident that we will win because uh, we uh, went into this situation out of, uh, I think that our feelings were very, uh, we were confident that we were doing the right thing. And uh, we know we were doing the right thing. And ultimately, just as uh, we'll do it, we were doing the right thing. Going down the road. What now? The the sh I saw it in New York, the Carnegie Theater. Oh, one of the best you know, movies I've seen in the past. But I'm just so happy that I knew there was no the job of uh, 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 projects that we have to take on from uh, uh, the destruction uh, of uh, was great? fisheries around the uh, Galapagos uh, Island, the destruction of fish populations uh, worldwide. The oceans are dying. And uh, unless we take some very aggressive action in the very near future, then uh, we might as well kiss them goodbye and ultimately our own species because we cannot survive upon this planet without. Uh, healthy marine ecosystems. Thank you very much. So, um, where for you personally after this? Is it back to California? Uh, I don't really know yet, right? Yet. I, I, I might go back to Newfoundland and uh, <coughs> serve the rest of the sentence to get the conditions removed right. from uh, the thing and then I'll, I'll continue to appeal it. And so you are only a few days removed from on, is it Wednesday? Was it? Uh, Friday. Friday. Actually, the Crown tried to stop me at the last moment by saying that two citizens from Newfoundland had signed $5,000 surgeries to release me. They did that at 3.30 on Friday, and fortunately we got them. In fact, the head of the Inshore Fishermen's Union came down to do one of them. And so, uh, at 45 seconds to 5 o'clock, we got them in there, they signed it, and that was out. But they tried everything they could to Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is that Oh, yeah, yeah, we worked with them. Was it Yvonne Chouinard started that organization about the Patagonian Bridge? No, no, no. This sounds all right. I think I assume will be because it is in Dallas. So fun. That's a good organization. Hi, Mom. What's your brother doing now? Uh, he's actually my first cousin. He's not my brother. No, he's my first cousin. But that movie, I mean, he's still making movies. Yeah, but I, he made yeah. one about the Matterhorn. Oh, oh, I thought it was stunk because I. Yeah, it was. Uh, but that they're going down the road. I mean, yeah. I, I we had a little budget there in the country. Every, every young, young kid should see that just so it makes you realize how poor you know, just the was a trap. How about putting that on camera? What I'm saying is that you were quite emphatic about that. What's your name? Yeah, my name is Jack. Johnson. I was a pilot with American Airlines and I was a layover on New York and I went to the Carnegie Hall Theater and I saw a movie that still shakes me up and I think about it today. It was Don Chabib's Going Down the Road and I was so shook up for about two years I just counted my blessings and I felt for those poor young kids and I think the movie was a masterpiece and I think it's time you came up with another movie. Another and keep up the good work. It is talking about how in third world countries, how the industrialized countries try and enforce their new environmental standards, and obviously they all, they want to get industrialized as quick as possible. So they find this is it's quite ridiculous that they should be um, continually doing like improving, upgrading um, these more expensive um, environmental practices. 
how can you explain to them that this is the best way? Well, the developer world has to come down to that level, not the developer world. And also just because uh, what people are doing in the developer world is wrong doesn't mean that the non-developer or what is called the non-developer world should emulate that by doing something like I know, I'm trying to say to them, you don't want to emulate us so yeah. much, you know, but it's... It's like uh, Joe Harlan Brundtland, who's called, you know, the Green Queen, for instance, where she's always pointing to third world countries and say, do this, this, and this, but don't do what we do, because we're a Western yeah. industrialized country. And how do you explain to them when they see these riches of the West? <laughs> well, those riches are only temporary, and that's what you have to really describe it. Sure. It's a temporary thing. That uh, when I was uh, a teenager, has been much more diminished now than it was then. Because, for instance, I go back to, say, my hometown where I was raised, which is St. Andrews by the Sea, New Brunswick, a fishing village. It used to be the largest lobster uh, village in the world. And I remember a mile of lobster traps. I remember going down to the beach and digging clams. I remember catching flounders. I remember uh, incredible diversity that was there, which had already been severely diminished for like 100 years ago. Then I remember bringing my daughter there. It was all gone in one generation. And now there's the illusion that nothing has happened because the economy has been replaced with tourism. But that also belongs to that Weaver for time. Long. After that, we do a bottle the OK Corral, and they can't tell me we did the bottle. There are no time yeah. guards yeah. with yeah. Yeah. shooting yeah. above yeah. my head. Everyone <laughs> seems people just refuse to look at the lessons of history, it seems. They just <laughs> continuously <laughs> do it. It's, it's, it's frustrating. frustrating. So yeah, the stage of life in Dewey is graced by the value of those who have disgraced themselves and trying to represent the human race and local culture. So when that Indian attacks that men are in the desert, or they're going to disappear. 2,000 miles away or over here. I swear, you can't tell if you were to blind person and fold somebody put them there. They wouldn't really recognize they're in any place different. Everyone just makes them look exactly the same thing. Most of us are the same thing. I don't understand. Of course, you can't think as I do. And so we're losing that very valuable diversity. And at the same time as we're losing that diversity, it's manifesting the itself with, uh, with cultural that separatist movements so that everybody says, again. well, we're losing this diversity, so <laughs> therefore, <laughs> inside of us, there's a need to preserve that which is different. And, and that's why you're having this, all of the world is happening, Quebec, or the Bosnia, or whatever, is that you have to preserve that because basically you're being very tribal yeah. oriented. And uh, subconsciously, I think we're really rebelling <laughs> against that forced unification, global unification, even though ultimately, uh, You've done right, it could work. Yeah, so I guess diversity and everything is the best. Yeah. yeah. How, how much are you speaking? Uh, um, how, how many talks do you go to? Well, I teach uh, at Pasadena Arts Center one semester every year, and then I do about 30 university lectures a year. Yeah. And that's because uh, I don't work for Sea Shepherd, so that's <laughs> mainly what I do for a living. Right. I want to say, uh, my name is Corinne Henderson. I received a call from you to say thank you very much. I'm going to aid in your presentation. Oh, it's a lot of the same techniques that you did. I used to take here. pictures of seals and harp seals and other seals with big faces close up. But um, I also took your advice in taking, I guess, advantage of my own talent and heading to the United States to study ethics behind seals. Somebody pushed out for that? Same thing with the college. Oh, you're, you're getting yourself into a real kid of worms on this one. I know. Who knows? Every belongs. So familiar yes. with uh, what I know. The, what the, uh, the problems are and what the solutions are. Um, and it, it's, it's so complex on so many levels. For instance, uh, Mark Small, who's head of the uh, the Sealing Association, the Sealing Association, the Association you, you know, he's lobbying to return the Sealing. But he doesn't really want to return the Sealing because if he does, then he's out of a job and he's got a very high paying job. So there's this illusion of trying to bring the Seal Hunt back. Mr. Tobin doesn't want to bring the Seal Hunt back, but he has to tell Newfoundlanders that he does want to bring the Seal Hunt back. And I'm convinced there won't be a major commercial seal hunt because there simply is no product. And uh, people are pragmatic and they're not going to go killing off the seals just, you know, to kill them off. What I'm afraid of is um, if your proposal goes through, is that it's going to not be an alternative, but just another way of exploring. Then it wouldn't be acceptable because uh, one of the reasons, see, they tried to get around me. The sealers went to the company and said, well, we can provide that we don't need Sea Shepherd. And the company said, no, no. We have to have a guarantee that this is cruelty-free and non-lethal. Right. And if we don't have that guarantee, then there's no go. Right. So, uh, the, the, you know, they can't, because they were saying, oh, well, we just take their hair and kill them. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I said, hey, you can't market a product that way. And, uh, but it is, you know, I would rather have a 
completely be not intrusive on mm -hmm. this, but the fact is, is that unless we provide some sort of alternative, and this I think is an ideal alternative because it's a process the seals actually seem to enjoy, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a great uh, relationship between two species where you're, you're giving service to one wild animal and they're providing a service back in return because, you know, it's a very itchy thing when they're losing their hair. Yeah. And they're actually very cooperative after you do the back, just put your finger under the clip and they voluntarily go on the back and let you do it. <laughs> and we did it. We've done. We've um, you know plucked the hairs off of a couple of thousand seals now. So you know we've got a good understanding that it's not anything that's harmful to them. Do you think then that that's going to be the first place of your argument, and then with that, and the public can make as much money? You, you actually could make more money. But the eider down industry is an extremely uh, valuable. Uh, that's an extremely valuable commodity. And how do you gather that by going around the nests and pulling eider down out of the nests. It's so much easier to pull 60 grams of uh, uh, seal hair, which is a better quality than eider down, from the back of a seal. Mm -hmm. So if you, can if you can provide an industry based on feathers in a nest, mm -hmm. you can certainly provide a major industry. And the eider down industry is more lucrative than the sealing industry ever has been. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you look at it from that point of view, you're looking at a very uh, uh, positive uh, possibility here. But the Canadian government won't do it. And the reason the Canadian government won't do it is, one, they can't see how seals can be killed in this, and they want the seals to be mm -hmm. killed. And two, the idea is coming from me. Yeah. <laughs> Three, um, they, uh, I don't know, the government ever wants to find anything that's a real alternative. Yeah. You know? And so now they're talking about killing 300 seals this year. Well, well they're tied up with the law of the government, mm -hmm. right? You know, and, the, and then, of course, uh, the, the laws that they're tied up under, you know, was it off of the divers' laws in the Bible. Is, you know, I mean, can we put butter on a, a roast beef sandwich? You know, the laws are in the way. Uh, you know, we keep holding one another into the, the confrontation. You know, they won't change. You know, I mean, that's what I had wrong with your remark. They are relatives of mine. When I talk to these people, you know, as an individual, they say, yeah, like, we can't do anything because of all these other people. Right. You know. So the thing is, uh, well, I don't, you know, I'm looking at really is that we're 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 fighting uh, economics and not we're well. The thing is, I was in the environmental movement before you started. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you were born before. Yeah, but the thing is, of course, they shafted me because I said, uh, you know, okay, what are we? Uh, what is all this pollution got to uh, do? Right, you know, uh, going down to the cities to feed one another to loan sharks to uh, argue before the courts and uh, rip and tear the material world for monetary gain rather than making the planet a better place to live. But that was far too radical at the time because they still owe one talk dollars and nonsense. They will always do I mean, still because the cost is the cost. The cost of smelting aluminum is 1,800 kilowatt hours a ton. It's floor spar miners long, there's lots of it. With the value in it is fine, mm -hmm. right? But the thing is, most of it, what is being produced, everybody's thrown out with their little laminates and, uh, and all that, a teaspoonful of aluminum in, uh, every day by the tens of, uh, of millions, and it's a liability. Now, that is poor economy, right? And you certainly yeah, it's just another environmental tax, right? I just wanted to say, you going over to the reception yeah, I'm trying to get there. Yeah, yeah well, you should just head over to well, the people have all gone over to the, the uh, refreshments, and uh, John Curley and I are the last ones to leave. Is Jonathan and David, one earth, communicating for On The Job. Check out the list of sponsors. Let's uh, backtrack on that and we'll freeze frame it for a minute. So here is a list of the sponsors. BC Ministry of Environment, Lands and Parks, the Notary Foundation, Van City Enviro Fund, Monday Magazine, that porno, 
Magazine Monday? Why would they sponsor an environmental law conference? Starbucks Coffee? Hmm, guess it's good for the coffee drinkers. Thrifty Foods? Baggy Pasta? Lifestyle Market? Mount Royal Bagel Factory? They say you can always tell who's supporting a particular movie by the advertisers. Now, why are these people supporting this particular conference with Paul Watson? Do they, in fact, know what they're doing? This maybe uh, gives them the benefit of uh, not knowing what they're doing. <laughs> Leonard Fowler. Hi, Leonard. Critical because if we look at butterflies and moths, as you know, they go through a four stage metamorphosis. And exactly as uh, made of this, so essentially it's 100% post consuming and uh, you know. I saved you for the last because I'm running out of film, oh. and I really like to hear what you have to say about what's going on here. Well, I think I think uh, Paul Watson is a gas, and he's just amazing. I, I, I'm so happy. Are you, are you going to go join him in the high seas? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. He's got a oh. terrific la uh, waiting list. Anyway, I wouldn't have. Oh, I bet you he needs competent do. people still. Oh, you're. They can always me. use you're, more. You're mocking me. <laughs> Lewis Lasowski. Hi, Lewis. Hi. You should grow a little more hair there. Eyesight now, you see the, the, the height you are at now. You're, you're still on now. What I'm going to do, I'm going to leave and just stand up because you're going to be standing anyway. Practice and then you can rewind it and see how you did. This is very good to watch how you okay. actually do it. So I, I'm going to leave you by yourself. I okay, please. Stand up. I don't really need to do this. I could talk back to this mirror image of Lewis on this tape and here he is practicing and he, he's about to say that he can't do this in front of himself that what we need is a live audience <coughs> and in control of our lives with their administration that we are going to have 
fish that we're going to be able to feed people, that our soup lines are going to disappear, that the unemployed are going to work. Can we put our faith, ask yourself that question, do, am I sure, can I be sure that the fish, that we're going to have salmon in the future, if I elect one of these political parties, can you even be sure that we're, you're going to have some salmon if you elect me? No. I would say you can't. You're right, Lewis. But, you know, I... How can we be sure? Forget it! <laughs> I just love this way okay. of to reacting. No. So how I can we be sure of survival? I think that the, in this instance we have to go back to moment. creation, you know what? Yeah, that there I, is a purpose. No, I, I can't put... I can't put... we have a, uh, an intelligent you know, the universe. Can we now look into the TV set? I'm talking, talking to a camera. Can no, look, right. now I'm looking to the TV set while you're talking to me. I've got to get... But look into the TV set. ...so that I am... You know, I know the audience is there. Yeah. If the audience is there, perhaps. Uh, Kamat, you going to shock cable? Yeah, this is going to be difficult, actually. It's more difficult than I thought. What are the, the messages? Yeah, I know. The, that's why we need them like one on one. Or here is even better. And you know, when you, you realize that when, you, when we're gathered here and I film what's happening here, I've got kind of given everyone a chance. Well, it's the way I film. Okay. It creates a whole feeling. Well, the thing is, I can't. Right? I can't. I can't trust the political parties. Yeah, I know. And I or the infrastructure in and place. I can't trust the. Uh, I can't put, I will not, I, there's no way I can put faith in, in, in the present established way of doing things that we're going to have salmon in the future. There's no doubt to, to me that if we're going to have salmon in the future, we are going to have to get together now and do it. Now we can get together now and do it if, they, if people want to. You know, the unemployed, all the people that want to work, all the unemployed people, let's get together now. We can meet down at the Old Salvation Army a building in, in town and we can see how we are going to do it. We've got some ideas. We've already been putting some of them in practice. We've already sent two crews out to, to, to work on the Fraser River. Now, the thing is we can get together with everybody and get to work on it right now. I'm pretty sure the inspiration will spread and we'll get the public support we need to do the job. It's just a matter of making that decision. The decision has been made. We're not going to rely on the election. We're not going to rely on these poli these, this political machinery to do the job because they are not reliable. They can't be trusted. Or perhaps they can be trusted, but the thing is I wouldn't trust them. So, are you going to participate in the f in the filming of the, uh, tonight? Do you want to trust them to? I'm going to try and get a message over the media tonight, and uh, maybe we can uh, we can reach enough people, and uh, we can get something uh, started uh, more started immediately. And you know, but uh, you know, it's going to take all of us, everybody's little bit, and we'll get it done. So you're having a. Um, uh you're inviting all of the candidates here for um, um, like a powwow, I guess, on May 22nd? May 22nd? Uh, I don't know what's going on in the organization. Or hmm. But, you know, we'll, we're definitely making some moves. Get off your butt! 90 seconds, Lewis, come on. 90 seconds, come on, this is it. All Canada's watching you right now. 90 seconds. Can you give me 90 seconds? <laughs> There's not the right background for that. But listen, I'm going to rewind it. You can and just sit back and watch it. Okay. The last couple minutes, we're, we're okay. Yeah, and then, okay, I want you to watch it and then just kind of go away and don't... Yeah. Run the, the, the last little bit out. Of the really, no doubt that things cannot change until you get the knowledge out to the people, the wisdom beyond knowledge out to the people. And 
course, mass media is is the way yeah. to do it. Yeah. But the problem that mo most people don't want to deal with is that the enemy owns the mass media. And the enemy has no intention of allowing you the either the airtime or the newspaper uh, words necessary to explain your point of view. That's why they bought it in the first place, is, is to send out their message, false messages, uh, to continue the programming and the fear they can engender in people, and uh, keep you from getting access to it. So if, if mass media is the way to do it, but it's out as, as a real option, then you have to look for other ways to get information out to people without the use of that technology. Yeah. And it comes down to uh, personal action, people on people, word uh, of mouth, and, word yeah. of mouth yeah. and, and, and creating critical mass, creating the, the, the numbers, putting together the common cause uh, and the numbers of people together who are going to force uh, the media to carry the message even if it's against their will because critical mass is just that. But it's the thing is, you know, if the actions are in, in everybody's benefit, like saving the salmon, you know, it's an immediate action on it, they probably will be supportive. I'm expecting the, the, them to, to support uh, the actions. They will only support the action if they feel the um, structure, the system, is in favor. Even though it may be to their benefit to support an action, they constantly, consistently refuse to participate in things they don't that make they don't feel like they have the thought through energy to do it. They don't well, not they just energy, the they, on them. they don't feel they will be supported by the system. They fear the system and therefore are afraid to do even the right thing because the system may disapprove. And the system happens to be controlled by an elite who don't want you to succeed. And, and therefore, uh, you, you have to set aside your, your search for an answer among just the ordinary people. The ordinary people are afraid. You have to go beyond the ordinary people to the people with integrity. And those numbers are much smaller than the masses. Because uh, of the circumstances at hand, which is unhealthy diet. If you're living on craft dinner and white bread every day and tap water, which is chlorinated, you don't have the strength of mind and character and body to even want to get out of the house, let alone try to search for organic cigarettes. And that, that's part of the problem. Most of the problem is from the day we are born, we are being programmed innocently even by our own parents to believe things that are untrue. And the programming continues in the public programming because it's not public education. Education, you would receive the truth. You are basically being programmed with a false sense of, of what history is all about. And that false sense of history is, is uh, continued by the media and the entertainment industry to make sure that you are afraid. And the difference between an animal and a human being is free will. But we have arrived at a point where the mass, being so afraid, has lost its independent thought, has lost its ability to observe, analyze, and conclude, and, and are not prepared, even to their own benefit, to participate in something that will cause the change to happen. So again, understanding that that's the problem, you must you have to speak to everyone because there are no stars on the foreheads of those people who have integrity or check marks next to their name in the phone book. But 
out of the people that you speak to, if you reach sufficient numbers, will come mm -hmm. the critical mass that will make the change once they understand they've been programmed with false information. And you can't tell them that they have. You can only express your view. And then these people with integrity go research. They go and find out their own answers. And when they conclude the same as you, then they come and work with you. Point him in the right direction, so to speak.